say, well, how do you know God exists? Well, it's an experience. And of course, there's different ways to describe an, exper uh, to describe an experience. But science doesn't like that. Science calls that experiential rather than experimental. And only things that are experimental count as valid. You've experienced it, we don't care. You've conducted an experiment, it counts. Now, if I said to you, what is it that keeps the population of planet Earth going? Well, really what it is on some level is it's love. What is it that draws a man and a woman together? Love. Okay, on some level at some point there's lust also, but in general, in order to stay together long enough to actually raise a family, lust wears off very quickly. What keeps us together? Love. But if you say to me, what's love? I don't believe love exists. Measure it. Explain it to me. Prove it. What are you going to do? If you're talking to somebody who's never been in love, somebody who's never experienced it, there is absolutely no way to use words and explain what that experience is. You cannot. You can talk about things like good feelings. You can talk about union. You can talk about it's very nice. But that doesn't, that doesn't even begin to touch on what love feels like. All you can do is pray that someday that person will also fall in love. And then they will also have the experience. And apne apo samajayenge. Because you cannot explain it. And that's the problem with science, is they have wiped out in one fell swoop the most fundamental aspects of life. Love, spirituality, God. So science has become something that is no longer explaining the world around us. It's explaining these tiny, tiny little aspects, but it's lost the big picture. <clears throat> I would like to ask you, uh, I was uh, very much, uh, I'm Mr. Bimbalkar, I'm uh, working on uh, exactly the connection of philosophy and science and uh, I have great confidence, I'm convinced that Vedanta is the blueprint of the cosmos, things existing and non-existing. And there are uh, very profound and maybe even scientific explanations in Vedanta about so many things if studied properly. Uh, what I would like to ask you is, in our psychology, as you are a psychiatrist, I would like to, we uh, say that mind is an organ, sixth organ. What is your experience about that? And uh, number two is, uh, recently, uh, Mr. Stephen Hawking has said, there is no God. I, know. I was hurt very badly. <laughs> Such a great man saying like this and uh, misguiding the world. And our Gita says, you are not supposed to misguide people by intelligence. I was very hurt. Such an intelligent person. He is a master of physics. <laughs> Why you should comment on God? And Gita says, if nothing exists, nothing can come out of that. If, if something exists, it cannot vanish. It is clearly said in Gita. See, when creation is there, there are two th things possible. One thing, it will be created from a raw material to something finished material. Or what is the creation? Our Hindu religion says that there was a big zero and from that creation has come. So I want to connect this to physics and <coughs> wipe out all this misunderstanding. And I like your beautiful explanation of understanding of science and understanding of uh, the things within. It's a great uh, um, turning point for me <laughs> as I am attending this lecture. Also, Western philosophy, as you said, it introduces you blackness and the light. <coughs> but I would like to ask you, what is your observation about the internet, the global psychology? What is the scenario? Okay. I'm going to take three, three pieces out of that that I hope, I hope sum it all up, mostly. One is the issue of Stephen Hawkins saying, there's no God. 
The other is the issue of physics and science and God. And the third is the issue of this internet. Stephen Hawking. Now, let me bring some psychology in here. My father is a divorce attorney. And he has spent his whole life divorcing the rich and famous, literally, of Hollywood, Beverly Hills. Okay, so I grew up in a dinner table conversation with stories of what wives would do to husbands and husbands would do to wives. Because divorce is not pretty. Luckily in India, it doesn't happen much. But it's not pretty. When someone has hurt us, or when we feel that someone has betrayed us, it's not enough to simply separate ourselves from that person. We want to rub their face in the mud, and that the whole world should watch, right? Every day, my dad deals with this. He'll come home, he'd come home, and he'd say, God, she was getting everything. This man offered her everything. Mother, the man was going to give her more than a judge would give her. But it wasn't enough, because he wasn't suffering enough. She wants him to suffer, that he should go through the trial, he should suffer. My dad would say, this is amazing, but this is psychology. He's hurt me, he's betrayed me. It's not enough that he should be out of my life and give me what I want. He needs now to suffer. I need to make sure that the whole world knows what a scoundrel he is. I am convinced from a psychological standpoint that these people who are vehemently anti-God, and I don't mean just your general run-of-the-mill atheists, but I mean the people who are traipsing around the world doing every possible thing they can to convince you that God doesn't exist, are people who feel betrayed by God. I would believe, and I don't know, I haven't done this, but I would believe that if you actually went back and you actually studied the biography of these people, what you would find is that they were not atheists from childhood. I believe you would probably find a deep religiousness in any religion. But at some point, something happened. between them and God. A loved one died or left them. Something they wanted to achieve that they had prayed for didn't happen. They lost something that mattered very much to them. Whatever it was. But that person on some level feels, I've believed in you my whole life. I've prayed to you my whole life. And now look what you've done to me. And I'm going to rub your face in the mud and make sure that everybody knows what a fraud you are. And that's, that's really my belief of why the adamancy. Because if something doesn't exist, fine, it doesn't exist. If it doesn't exist, why are you going to waste your time writing about that it doesn't exist and go around the world? Tachik, it doesn't exist. Kuchor, Kudofert, right? We only are going to be so vehement about it when it actually was something that was very important to us at one point in our life. And we have felt betrayed. Now we need to make sure that the whole world knows what a fraud he is. And I believe really that that is, that is the motivation, in my opinion, behind all of these books. Now, science and God. In one line, very quickly. These are, these are debates that rishis and scholars have had that have gone on for years and years and years and years. So there's, there's no way to give an answer in two minutes. But I want to give one very quick way that I think about it. I've been in a science laboratory. I know what happens in a chemistry laboratory when you try to mix things together. Anybody who's ever been in a laboratory knows that when you put elements together, you throw molecules together in a laboratory, what happens? 99% of the time, nothing. You stand around, you're looking in the crucible, nothing. 1% of the time, you get some variety of smoke, fire, or a bad smell. That's what happens in science laboratories. The concept, the idea that there's no God and that random molecules flying against each other in space 
created life is inconceivable to me. You could take random molecules and throw them against each other forever and you couldn't get a mosquito. You couldn't get a leaf. You couldn't get a blade of grass. And we're saying he created, the, the whole world was created like that? It's inconceivable to me. As a scientist, it doesn't make sense. When we know which elements to mix together, we still can barely get it right. And these people are saying it was random. Random molecules flying against each other and life was created. As a scientist, it doesn't make sense. Even now, we know. We know what our bodies are made out of. A good biologist could tell you what percentage of your body is carbon, what percentage is nitrogen, what percentage is oxygen. They, they know these things. I don't know the numbers offhand, but scientists know. But you can't create a human being in a Petri dish. Even with the knowledge, we can't do it. So the idea that without the knowledge, randomly, it just happened. It's not even scientific to say that. Now your last point was about the internet. What were you saying? In, uh, international psychology scenario. Oh, international psychology. What do you mean about Means that? Means you are from America. Mm -hmm. You studied Western psychology. Mm -hmm. Now you are impressed by Indian uh, mm -hmm. psychology and this. And she was asking about uh, Buddhism and all these things. But uh, other places, what is the scene in psychiatry and psychology? Well, this is, this is what I was touching upon before, is that they're really good at showing us the darkness. If you walk in to a Western psychologist and, psychologist and you say, I have anger, they'll sit you down, they'll put you on the couch, they'll take you back to your childhood, and at some point when you were five, your you know, mother promised you she was going to come home with a toy and she forgot, or your you know, big brother got a bigger piece of, you know, pizza and you didn't get it and so you were angry. And they'll take you back to all of these times and you'll re-feel the anger and you'll express it. And the psychologist will say, good, good, yes, let it out, let it out. How did it feel to have the smaller piece of pizza? And you'll start to scream and you'll get very angry and you'll feel like you've made some progress. And eventually if you keep doing it, you'll discover and uncover all of the things in your childhood that made you angry. But that insight is not actually enough to make you any less angry today. And in India, if you came to Swamiji and you said, I'm angry, he'd say, give it to me. Come, let us go stand on the banks of Ganga, give it to her. And if you believed, you'd be free. And it doesn't matter that the source of the anger was that when you were five, your brother got a bigger piece of pizza. What matters is that today at 60, you need to be free of it. And that's the difference. <laughs>